now we are moving to our uh, next speaker, and I'm sure that we will get a lot of practical insights since we have Esther Godwin Brown as the next speaker. Uh, she is a partnerships manager and strategist working on the Circular Jobs Initiative at Circular Economy. So, for those who are not familiar with Circular Economy yet, it is an impact organization that connects and empowers a global community to create the conditions for transformation towards a circular economy. The Circular Jobs Initiative is a knowledge center within circular economy that aims to ensure the transition to the circular economy is positive for work and workers. Esther has background in social policy and learning, having previously led work on the social integration of young people and the employment and personal development uh, of mind to late career professionals. And we are happy and proud that Esther and her organization is also the member of the Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. So please, Esther, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with everyone. I'll just get my slides up. Can you all see my slides? Yes, yes, works fine. Great. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, it's great to be here with everyone today with such an expert group of speakers um, and panelists. And I'm here to start the discussion off around adult learning and education. And so, you've had a little introduction to circular economy, um, but to give you a scope on what I'll be covering in this presentation is our experience working with with cities, with nations, and with businesses, and from our research looking at the what is needed to make sure that we get the skills for these, the, the, so these practical and scalable solutions can be um, carried out in the workplace on the city level, how we can make sure those are in the workforce when we need them. And so our work on the Circular Jobs Initiative is very much looking at the social impacts of the circular economy. Um, so we have a focus area on the quality of work, on the inclusivity of the jobs that the circular economy is related to, but then also looking um, very clearly at skills and what the education pathways are that are needed um, to ensure that people across the workforce have the skills we need. And so I wanted to really quickly touch on what we define as circular jobs at circular economy, because I think it helps with the bounds of our discussion and also um, build on some of the points earlier that were made around this isn't just about um, engineering and STEM skills and the professions associated with those. There's really a wider set of, of workers and skill sets that we need to take into account. So we say that a circular job is any occupation that directly um, interacts with one of the elements or the key strategies of the circular economy or indirectly supports them. And so by that, I mean, um, we see in light blue what we call the core strategies of the circular economy, repair, recycling, renewable energy, and with the enabling strategies using technology and design and new forms of collaboration to accelerate um, and scale these strategies. So this is what we call core and enabling circular jobs. But then we also take it one step further and look at the indirectly circular jobs. So here we're talking about education, the educators that we need to make sure that the skills are available and that the circular economy um, transition can achieve the pace of change it needs to. Uh, the people working in procurement, in marketing in, and in strategy. So really thinking about all the different workers that have a role to play. And so I wanted to really quickly just reflect on sort of the size of the task um, and because there's fair consensus that what we need is that a general upskilling um, that also all workers will require in terms of task diversification and advances in technology. And so, you know, in the UK alone, we're seeing one in 10 workers now will need reskilling re re to meet the demands of the green recovery. So it's really about how do we get these skills um, to develop the, the workers that are already in the workforce. We can't wait. Um, what can we? What do we need to do now? And so, in France alone, between 2017 and 2020, it was predicted that 80,000 workers needed training on building information modeling. So, this is one very specific skill set um, which might have a clearer skills pathway. But there are also a myriad of other skills um, and disciplines that are coming into the market uh, that we need to understand what the best routes to reskilling are. 
And I wanted to briefly touch on some research we did where we compared the education needs of roles that we would say are associated with the circular economy and those that aren't. Um, so here again, you can see those enabling and core elements of the circular economy I spoke about earlier. Um, and in general, these enabling jobs that are much more about upscaling um, and accelerating those core strategies of the circular economy, a much higher level of education was required than um, those jobs when we compared in other areas of the economy. And then zooming in on one of the strategies and looking at the, the skills and the training, the on the job training and the work experience um, that architects and engineers in the renewable energy space compared to um, other areas of the energy sector required. The, here you can see that as well as a sort of a slightly higher level of higher education, it was really in the in the work experience on the on the job training where you see the greatest difference. So really the conclusion is that there are a, a large range of skill sets that are needed in the circular economy, but we really see this need, this extra need for really practical and applied learning that can be um, delivered whilst people are in work as, as upskilling. And as we've discussed today, and we're all agreed, the, you know, the circular economy transition needs to be rapid. And it is a transition, it's a means to end, which means that we need continuous learning and we need to adapt our ways of thinking and our approach to education um, in work as well as at earlier stages so that it can, it can be adaptive and people can develop those transferable and transversal skills that we're seeing are going to be really important. And so it's combining some of the skills, those really strong foundation of skills in lots of areas of, of industry that there currently are, but really upskilling those with some, some new novel skills in line with new technologies and these transferable, transversal skills, so systems thinking, critical thinking, which will remain relevant um, as sectors transition and, and role scopes might change. Um, and this is this point here builds a little bit on what David was saying about the chicken and the egg, that we that we see that the circular economy transition depends on both, you know, it will shape the skills market, but it also depends on the skills that we have now. So we need to understand how we can develop our current workforce um, rather than waiting for the skills market to, to change it in that way. And so, you know, we need to reflect these changes in learning provision for the workforce at, at all levels. So I wanted to touch on some of the challenges that come out in um, from speaking to businesses and stakeholders and, and our research. So and there is a lot of uncertainty around what the skills are that will be needed um, more widely, but also in specific industries. And this is leading to uncertainty um, and hampering innovation. And in the Netherlands alone, I think 25% of companies say that skills gaps are the main thing that's holding them back um, from developing their company. Um, we also see that there's a strong bias towards uh, continual learning and upskilling being available to more highly skilled workers. So those with the most skills um, will have greater opportunity to develop their skills. So we really need to consciously think about how to make sure that these upskilling um, opportunities are available to workers across the spectrum. Here, this point about learning being linear is Yes, we can draw a parallel with the, the linear economy, but it's also about the mindset and the association that we have with education. I mean, there are, as we've discussed, it's like a, a myriad of different adult education uh, services available in all different areas. But really, the traditional mindset for many workers is that you are skilled for one career, um, you learn on the job, and the, this continuous cycle of learning is something that really needs to be built into companies and workers as a, as a new behavior. The circular economy being into multidisciplinary, um, we've also we've already touched on the fact that this is perhaps a challenge when it comes to education. Um, and here we're thinking specifically about those more specialized courses um, where you're uh, taught a particular trade, where actually if we're looking at roles becoming more multidisciplinary, how do we make sure that people can patch different disciplines together 
and develop a more diverse skill set. And a more immediate challenge that we've seen come through is the potential shortage in, in vet, path, vet, vet placements and other practical learning opportunities in the face of COVID-19, where it's not possible to go out and learn um, in these spaces and where we see that, you know, academia is relatively a safe harbour because you can adapt learning to being online. So it's really about making sure that we come up with new solutions if this is going to be a persistent issue that people aren't able to go into these places of learning to make sure that that's, that disparity between the more uh, theoretical, highly skilled and the practical um, skilled workers, that that provision gap doesn't widen. I also wanted to touch on professional learning and this builds on some of what people have said around the informal learning and learning not just always being needed to be embedded in a curriculum. Um, because the options that are available to professionals, obviously some of those come through their employer, uh, through training providers, so maybe returning um, to education. But there's, there's also different forms of learning that I think were really important which that can be um, translated through companies. So you know, how do you uh, teach people the mindset and the systems thinking that we talk about being needed in the circular economy through leadership and core company values? How did you translate that across the workforce? Um, and then how do you think about how to integrate the skills and the competencies needed in the circular economy into management practices, HR practices, um, and utilize the, you know, the right sort of competency frameworks to really motivate people to develop their skills. And learning on the job, um, this is, I was reflecting on a conversation I had with a um, union rep working in the energy sector in Norway, and we were discussing the bias of, you know, more highly skilled workers often getting more opportunities for training. And he said, you know, I'm sure that's true, but there's also a lack of recognition about different types and different levels of learning. So he said that lots of the workers that he sees working on the factory floor, with new technologies and new processes when they come in, you know, learning is part of the job. It might be monthly, it might be yearly when these processes come in, but it's seen as part of the job and it's not necessarily always recognized as um, formal training. And here's, I wanted to dig into an example um, from the construction sector. As David said earlier, the built environment is a, a huge area where there's a lot of momentum and a, a clear need uh, to uptake circular strategies. And the point I made earlier around specialised to multidisciplinary, um, we recently completed some research in Scotland where we were looking at the labour market opportunities associated with different circular strategies within different value chains in the Scottish economy. And within construction, we saw that off-site construction and well, prefab construction um, is potentially a, a growth market in Scotland, which can reduce waste and encourage the use of renewable materials. And here we were seeing a trend away from specialised on-site workers, carpenters, masonries, electricians, plumbers, towards these more multi-skilled operatives that when they receive the different prefabricated units that they're made in the factory on site, really they're there to finish spaces for use um, and to really do a little bit of everything. And so the challenge here is how do we make sure that the training is available for those workers so that they can work in that really adaptive way and how do we um, encourage that and that ownership of those multiple different skill sets. In terms of optimising digital skills during time out of work, um, here I'm really reacting off some, some papers and articles I've seen over the last six months around how, well, the question of how to um, motivate people to learn in times when they're not able to go to the workplace or to go on site. Um, and it was encouraging to see the reaction of governments to making sure that um, in countries where there are furlough schemes or other employment um, support when people couldn't go into work, making sure that people knew that learning wouldn't compromise those, those benefits. And in the construction sector, I think there was a particular example in France 
they're using this opportunity to upskill workers on digital skills whilst they're at home and unable to come into work because this has been a skill that you know for a long time has been identified as um, a, a key gap which is hampering innovation um, in the construction sector and then i wanted to touch on an example around these enabling jobs so the jobs outside of of dealing with the actual material flows um, in several countries including the uk they have brought in um, a quota for the number of workers in their procurement departments that they want to be trained on BIM level two, so building information modeling. And this is really important because it means that they can start procuring in a way um, that takes into consideration the life cycle of materials and is much more collaborative and conscious in that way. And indeed, you know, BIM level two is the level at which that they were told to train because that was the level of training that was available. And as technology advances and we have um, BIM level three, four, and five, you know, these workers will continue to need to, need to be um, developed. And then I just wanted to end on some of the opportunities because there are opportunities as well as challenges. Um, as we said here today, it's not just about people coming into the labour market in the next five to 10, 20 years. It's about making sure that we can create this change now. And so there's a real opportunity to just much more promote the circular economy as a career destination for to mid to late career professionals, people that have a really strong foundation of skills or um, an experience in different sectors over their lifetime, which actually might work quite well when we're thinking about multidisciplinary roles in the circular economy. When I say maximizing on innovative forms of learning and knowledge exchange, what I'm really thinking of here is really maximizing on practical places where people can go and learn um, in real time about the technology that's coming onto the market. So having more demonstrator wind turbines or off-site construction factories or regenerative farms where people, where professionals can go and learn, but they're also crucially where educators can go and learn. Because we may have many professors that have been in their roles for a number of years, but will not be have been exposed to some of these new um, processes and technologies that are coming onto the market. So here it's about you know training the current workforce and the current educators. Um, as I mentioned, procurement is a, sort of a key route for driving the uptake of circular strategies, but then also driving demand for skills. And through driving demand for skills, having a knock-on effect into the type of training that um, employers are calling for. And when we think about this emerging labour market, which is much more adaptive, where transferable skills are much more relevant, I think there's an opportunity around seeing vet pathways as a real key in that in that cog, because they are in a way more adaptable. You know, they're practical, um, they're on the job. If we're going into a, a space to work in that way, there's not more of an opportunity to bring in new disciplines um, than the challenges that we might see in the higher education space. And I also think, thinking of that example of people learning online um, digital skills whilst out of work, that there is a real opportunity to build on the recent momentum that has been on online learning and online connecting. Um, and to really try and push those fantastic online courses that are already available, these MOOCs, um, to a wider group of workers so that, um, you know, where possible and where appropriate, people can use time where they're not able to be in the office for learning. I just wanted to quickly share some of our, our resources in case anyone was interested to see them. But apart from that, um, thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, great overview of, of what is happening, what is available, what are the challenges, obstacles, gaps that we have to overcome. So I think it's a great starting point also uh, for the discussion now. And just before we open the floor for the discussion, I would like to say that we have agreed that after the discussion, uh, we will have a short break 
because it's really very intense, everything. So after we close this panel, we will close it five minutes earlier and we will take five minutes just to uh, refresh a little bit to stretch your legs and so on. So uh, now the floor is yours and I'm inviting the first one who would like to comment to step out. Martin Charter again here. Can, can I um, pose the question I posed to Guido uh, again? Uh, so, within uh, maybe I'll just give a bit of context. Uh, you know, as one element of circular economy, particularly in the technical system, uh, repair cafes now, there's about, you know, 2,100 around the world with the highest proportion in uh, Europe. And, and somebody's done the first global surveys in that, but I also chair and set set one up, I see it on the ground. So what I, I see there is amazing skills, you know, across uh, electronics, across mechanical, bicycles, clothing, textiles, and uh, very high repair rates because of the skills and knowledge, up to 65% generally is the average, which is incredible based on products coming in, repairers looking at it, you know, and and then repairing them. So there's obviously tremendous practical skills. It's not academic skills, it's practical learned skills over time in various functions of, and people who've trained themselves or retrained themselves from other disciplines. So, um, you know, because you're sort of helicopter on it all, you know, how do you see those, that sort of, those sort of packages of knowledge then being more, brought in to more sort of structured education and training? Um, I think it's a really interesting point because this, the repair skills, although we see that in repair cafes and in your more traditional repair shops on the high street that I think we're all used to growing up with, there is this really strong sense of repair skills. There's also, um, as you mentioned, a real a gap in repair skills and how we can translate that from well into the public and into consumers but also into more mainstream retail um, and industry and i think it's a challenge it depends it's also quite context dependent on what the business case or what the sort of the tax taxation model is around materials in different countries because you see in countries where there is a really low um rate of repair and a low uh, level of repair skills. This is where, you know, new products are so much cheaper than getting things repaired that there really is not an incentive and it's not part of the, the, the national mindset to repair things. So I think it's also always also quite context um, dependent. And I think it's using these repair cafes where we can um, for these practical sorts of learning that you're not just going to um, a course to learn how to repair, maybe you're shadowing and getting mentorship from some of these people in the community that are learning. Can I just quickly, quickly follow up um, on that? I mean, the basic point that I've, you know, somebody has been around the area in effect for sort of a long time, but also seeing it on the ground here, there is, there are tremendous skills that are just sitting there in the community that are going um, un unused. And there's a sort of broader strategic point about how we bring that on, even allowing for those macro points and, you know, BAT, you know, in, in Austria or, you know, Sweden, uh, et cetera, those, those you know, it, it's just a very practical point about that knowledge transfer, because on the other side of it, wearing my other hat, I then tried to bring students in textiles and whatever, you know, from uh, from UCA, to sit in and, and you know encourage them to, to to shadow as you were saying, but we didn't have so much buying. Perhaps it was a Saturday morning between ten and twelve, and they weren't particularly mobile at that time. Uh, but there there is that other side of the transfer of higher education and students looking back into those initiatives for that uh, knowledge which isn't in the curriculum. Yeah, Esther, would you like to refer to that or uh, shall we give the floor to others? I think one point I would make is we're trying to think more about how to create more interlinkages between uh, circular economy organisations and what we 
see as the social economy. So local community organizations um, that really their their mission, their social mission first um, and employment is for the, so the greater good and for personal well-being and you know profit second. And often these organizations have a presence in communities and are working in repair or in reuse or in resale of, of different types of products. So there's a the network of organizations in uh, Dwingwinkle in Europe, but then there's also lots of other um, examples of sheltered workshops where people can come and learn skills from all different areas of the labor market or those distant from the labor market and learn those sorts of repair skills. So it's also thinking about you know how who who we want to train up with these skills and the different models of learning and the different sorts of organizations we should be bringing into this sort of circular economy thinking. Yeah, yeah, I, I have a, a two part question um, the, and this covers actually something in which the discussion has moved into a little bit. Um, one of the things that um, we observe is, um, for example, with remanufacturing. So we're very interested in remanufacturing in the built environment. And one of the things we'd like to explore uh, in the Netherlands is building a uh, large scale lab, I call it. Uh, there's an example of this in with Fraunhofer Bayreuth in Germany for automotive or Nabil Nasser in Rochester Institute of Technology in the United States. And the idea there is that you can bring together companies, uh, learners, researchers, all together in a safe space where companies could then trial out doing remanufacturing in a line. High capital investment, high level, high learning, fantastic. So that's one, uh, one area. And that's very business to business, higher education change driven in that way. Now let's look at a different area. Now I'm currently involved in a Horizon 2020 that's looking at circular maker spaces in cities. And we're not just looking at uh, cities and societies more generally, we're looking at members of the societies in the seven pilot cities who have distance to the workplace. So they have uh, mental health issues, they have physical uh, uh, health issues, they have been long-term unemployed. You know, that the 10% of every European city that has real challenges. And that's what we're doing there. And the idea is that we use circular maker space in order to upskill them. Now, that's a world away from the remanufacturing lab with the big name companies, but they're both valid. And I think one is closer to what Martin's been talking about, uh, cafes and so on and so forth, uh, in some ways, not totally. And the other is much more closer to the areas where we've been talking about higher education. And I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that both of them are valid, don't you think? Definitely. And I think there's a lot to learn, not just in the sort of the technical skills from those organizations that are working with people from the distance of the labor market, but also about the quality of work. Um, and this is you know, a slightly separate topic than, than what we're touching on today, but when we think about the, some of the traditional jobs of the circular economy, they're not always seen as very high quality. Um, and there can be issues around, you know, working conditions and health and safety, whereas in, within the social economy and within the shelters workshops that we've um, seen a lot of, it's really about nurturing a workforce. It's about developing people to maybe to move on to other places, but also to think about you know, what is the role of work outside of of income and profit, and what what um, role does work serve for the, on the individual, but also the community level? So just reflecting that I think there's a lot that we can learn from these other organisations that might not be seen as as high technology and where the big investment is going, um, but perhaps we need to um, you know facilitate more uh, exchange between these two sides of the system. Uh, thanks, Esther. And because you mentioned this right now, so I would really encourage other participants who did not speak yet or didn't raise their hand uh, to share something because th this is about, uh, as you said, one side and the other. So experiences and we can see in a chat box how also the mindset or priorities are changing. So from being very uh, 
education, formal education oriented to become a handyman or handywoman. So please, the others who are there, uh, feel free and uh, add something. So, Anna maybe didn't speak up yet. Okay, well, uh, when I, I've been uh, listening to Esther, uh, two things that I've written on the, on the chat. Uh, it's not only about skilled people. Uh, we should know what skills, uh, of course, we need. And Esther has have mentioned, uh, has mentioned some of them, but also about or organizational change because uh, it's about how uh, organizations uh, change their mindset about circular economy, about sustainability, how they are going to contribute to the sustainable development goals. So this change or this uh, vision should be uh, within the, the organization and change all the, all the machines in the company or universities, this is a, this is a challenge. So it's like uh, maybe the, the two sides of the coin. So that 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 was my my point. And I also, having said that, uh, I wanted to highlight what uh, Widow Soneman says about these uh, T shaped profiles, uh, because we we work on, on that on on that uh, on that type of uh, programs, and we work with them. And the transversal skills that also Esther has mentioned are really relevant uh, for uh, uh, open your mind and have a wider uh, perspective on, on how to uh, address uh, the movement of circular economy and changing organizations. Uh, that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Very valuable about changing the mindset. This is so hard. We are uh, so uh, keen of changing the others, but not to yes, yes. how to change ourselves. To look inside. What I want to change in me, so I can change in others. So this is a yeah. We always so. have recipes for 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 others. For others, yes. <laughs> yeah. hi, hi there. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, Theo, please. Hi, it's Theo Hacking. I'm from the University of Cambridge at the Institute for Sustainability Leadership. So I've been listening with interest, and my comment isn't specifically for the last speaker. It's rather to say that we, we're covering a very broad canvas and uh, a very broad range of potential targets for our teaching. And I think it's going to be quite difficult to really um, maybe progress unless we seg segment it in some way. Because clearly, you know, people at different stages of their learning would have very different needs, and the challenges would be very different um, to, to, you know, to more people at a more advanced level. And, and, and equally, we've been talking about the training of engineers and technical type people versus training, you know, people from other disciplines. And I, I'm sure there are some general challenges around funding and um, teaching capability and the like. But um, I, I feel that we'll have to sort of try to talk about particular domains if we want to m maybe move forward. But um, to, from a more personal interest, I would be quite uh, curious to know what the group feels about the relationship between circular economy and sustainability, because um, we've spoken about circular economy as a fairly recent concept, but in many ways it's a, it's a very old concept because it's rooted in things like industrial symbiosis and um, cradle to cradle and many other things that have been around for a very long time. And equally, um, sustainability is a concept that's been around for a, long, a longer time. Um, our institute has been working in this field for, for about um, 30 years now. And we've been wrestling with this notion of whether we uh, move to a circular economy framing or, or not. And of course, it depends on which audience you're talking to, because for some, it makes its intuitive simplicity, its kind of technocratic feel is, is quite appealing. But for others, it's, it's quite reductionist and quite mechanistic, because it has a, a sort of an engineering mindset. And many of the models that you see are, are very much foregrounding materials and energy and, 
and and and, and inanimate, inanimate things as being the the kind of the the, the, the center piece of our attention. And um, if you talk to social scientists and ecologists and others, they'll say that that is very much the problem. You know, the fact that we are thinking of the world through the lens of materials and um, energy flows is, is the problem. We're not thinking it in terms of social systems or ecological systems and the like. And I think a lot of people have struggled to actually especially bring in the social dimension into the circular economy agenda. But that's not to say that it's not a helpful agenda, agenda for, for certain audiences where their main uh, mandate and their main and thinking is around uh, materials, products, energy, and the like. So I guess that those are just some reflections. I unfortunately don't have many of the answers yet. It's, it's something we've been grappling with for a long time. So I really look forward to the, the conversation to see um, what insights might might emerge. Thank you, David. Yes, I see. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited about this. Uh, I'm going to have it. I'm going to do this really short because um, so first of all, what's the difference between circular economy and sustainability? Well, this is my opinion, not my scientific research. So let's go with an opinion. Um, sustainability has a big focus on what I call the triple bottom line, the people, planet, profit, whichever definitions you want to use. And what tended to happen in the sustainability communities is there was a strong emphasis on the environmental, the, pla the planet aspect, uh, very much less on the people and much less on on the business so the, the it didn't really take off with the business community it was very much a, uh, an academic type subject perhaps and society engaged in it to a certain extent circular economy however comes along and says well actually the trick you missed guys was you didn't engage the business and if you don't engage the business you're not going to change the world so there's a much heavier focus on on the profit aspect, the business aspect, we can bring business in to make it happen. Now, I would suggest a weakness of both is there still isn't the societal engagement. Uh, circular economy publications don't talk about society much, and nor did sustainability publications talk about society so much. There's a kind of implicit thinking that if circular economy is successful, it looks after the planet and it looks after business, so therefore society will make it. Well, I don't think that's going to work. And I looked at his... Am, am I allowed to respond finish briefly? Go on then, go on, go on. Just, just to say that the whole notion of sustainability and sustainable development grew out of a reaction against the purely ecological conservation type yeah, movement. Know, and so it was very strongly rooted in the fact that we couldn't just um, solve the global challenges by focusing on the environment. So it certainly came as a surprise to me when I came to Europe to see how it has been adopted as largely an environmental agenda. Yeah. But in many yeah. other parts of the world, it's very strongly a deve de developmental agenda with the social yeah. dimensions having an yeah. incredible um, foreground. In terms of the business focus, I think it depends a great deal on on which companies you are talking to. Um, at our institute, we've been we work almost exclusively with business, and we have been framing it around the sustainability agenda. And many businesses find that very reassuring because they're aware that the social dimensions are amongst the most challenging, especially if they're working in developing countries. But obviously, companies that work in the manufacturing space that are in a certain sectors would find the circular economy perhaps too um, comforting for them because they, they feel that they can solve it with their normal technocratic interventions. And I, I'm an engineer by training, so I, I, I don't have a particular um, uh, you know, aversion to, 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 to that, that, that way of, uh, of solving problems. And of course, engineering is rooted in a, in a sort of reductionist way of thinking about problems. But that could also be um, the challenge when it comes to trying to progress to um, you know, many of these mindset changes that we've been talking about. Okay, yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm coming at it with a global North Western European perspective. And, and yes, that's, that's valid. Uh, your point is valid about that. And yes, sustainability is seen as different in different parts of the world. Uh, circular economy thing was kind of born in, to a greater or lesser extent in Western Europe. So um, uh, it, it comes with that baggage, I suppose. Um, I was just going to add on finally that the Sustain, uh, the social uh, the social sustainability, the social circular economy space. One of the challenges with that, and you see it in the Pop Makina project, which I put a link to in the chat. We find the big challenge there is where's where do we make money? There isn't money in the projects we're looking at. We're talking about people with social distance, uh, social uh, distance to the workplace, um, 
these are the burden people, uh, that's the wrong expression, but go with it, in cities and societies. So there's no money to be made there. Companies are not interested. in the, They're not a market. They're not a target market much. Uh, they're not potential employees in many cases, or they often get rejected. Quite wrongly, by the way, but this, this is the reality. So that's a real big challenge that we have when we engage societal circular versus business circular. By the way, I've worked with your organization, so I'm familiar with what you do. Yeah, th thank you for this intervention. Well, yeah, uh, we'll go back. I just have to add something here because we so often have these discussions about the definitions, about the roots of the whole movement, to call it so. And sometimes we forget what is the final goal. This is the well-being of everyone on this planet, well-being of the nature, well-being of the humans. So this is sometimes, and then we start, start fighting around the definitions. I just wanted to add that. So yeah, uh, please, uh, we will go to Esther and then, uh, of course, to the others who are waiting in the queue. Yeah, I completely um, support and echo what you said. And thank you, Theo, for this, for that comment, because that is something that with the Circular Jobs Initiative and with our organization more widely, we're trying to really do is, you know, the circular economy did become very much based on materials, on technocratic processes. But really what we need to be doing is thinking about the wider social impacts. And the circular economy, as I said, is a, a means to an end, just as uh, sustainability thinking is. The end being somewhere where people and the planet can thrive. The economy is just a vessel through which um, that some of that some of that happens. Um, so I just wanted to to echo that that really it's about trying to now that we are a certain point with the momentum of the circular economy widening it out and saying actually what are we trying to achieve here um, and saying that the circular economy is a way of of being less wasteful and and recycling the materials but also rethinking value and do we value a, a, a tree planted in a forest or do we value it chopped down so it's just thinking how we can use circular economy thinking and the movement as a way to try and you know, refocus what the end goal is as well Thank you. Now we have Carol waiting, and thank you for this, Esther. Uh, it is it is really important, and I think uh, yes, we are talking today about the knowledge and uh, the education, but wisdom is needed as well. <laughs> so, Carol, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I want to dwell on that actually, and and um, I appreciate very much the comments of of uh, Theo. Um, I think it, even more interesting than the question what the difference between sustainability and circular economy is, is the question what the difference between education and sustainability and circular economy is. I think there are quite some uh, similarities. And what I noticed is that we discussed um, uh, mainly the knowledge base for circular economy here, uh, which is important, of course, but it's not the only thing we should discuss. Um, um, I find it more important actually to, to look at what skills do we need and what skills do we need to transfer to, to, um, <clears throat> to students, but also to, to, to um, yeah, working people and, 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 and so on. And there, I think it's, it's very, very similar with, with what we need for sustainability education. So uh, systemic thinking is, has been mentioned uh, several times already this morning. That, that's true. That, that's uh, that's one aspect. Um, I also think long-term thinking is, is, is very important. So the, the capability uh, of, of, yeah, uh, of scenario building, of, of uh, anticipatory uh, thinking, and so on. And also transdisciplinary uh, working is, is important, not only interdisciplinary between disciplines, but also uh, from uh, with, with, with other uh, stakeholders in the society and so on. Um, and we have to. to uh, I also I also echo the the comment of of Theo that this um, the discussion is very broad. It's um, about uh, academic uh, education. It's about vocational education, uh, school children, and so on. But we should also look at um, you know, what what skills are. Uh, important and are important for the different target groups and what can we learn from the different target groups and how can we learn from each others. Uh, 
uh, to give you an example, yeah, I, I give quite some courses on circular economy at KU Leuven, um, and systemic thinking for engineers is, is, is uh, should be quite quite obvious. Although I have to say that that's it's also quite narrow to 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 more the the engineering side of of of, of the coin. But um, I, I also was lucky to have some. Um, yeah, some some training for um, lower skilled uh, young people. I was involved in a project of of uh, circuit frowners for for that. And uh, what struck me is that the entrepreneurial skills of those people are actually very good. So bringing together these people with with uh, university students was then the next step, and was very very interesting to see. How these these skills uh, could be transferred. So, so two messages. Actually, actually I think we should, um, yeah, dwell more on on what skills uh, are needed to transfer to to different target groups, and and the second message is that that yeah, we also need this this transdisciplinary working and um, yeah, learning from from. Um, People in companies, but people in also uh, with, with other types of, of skills um, in other positions is, is, is important as well. Thank you, Carl. Uh, I see here Rebecca uh, added something uh, in the chat box. Maybe Rebecca, you would like to tell us something more about uh, this uh, YouTube video. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thanks. Yeah, just a moment, because I know everybody's dying for a break. Um, I suppose it's been fascinating this morning. Thank you, everybody. Um, we started as TED, Textiles Environment Design, as a research centre in 1996. In 2017, we transformed ourselves into Centre for Circular Design in recognition of really where we were heading, where, where the roots had always been for textiles. Um, and I think recently the conversations have been around um, social innovation and circular economy for us as researchers working with our PhD students at UAL in particular. And um, last about two weeks ago, I think we, we did this uh, event, which was a whole week of dedicating ourselves to the climate crisis and all of the staff and students coming together from all disciplines. Um, and it was really powerful. And it was all online, of course. Um, but we sort of made uh, these talks and they're about materials and systems, of course, but they're also about people and power, the circular economy, how we move through these phases of eco, green, sustainable and intercircular uh, and what this might mean for kind of uh, social innovation in the future. So I just posted them there um, for future reference. Thank you. Great to see the initiatives and also nice to see how things are evolving because this is an ongoing learning process and it is good that we are flexible in that. So uh, I would take another question and then I suggest this short break. So just to do some exercises and get some oxygen. So who would like to uh, wrap up this uh, round? If there is no one else uh, then yeah uh, uh, just just very just very quickly i mean i've been writing in the chat it's an academic hobby isn't it this and it's our job we we talk about words and terms and you know because we're academics we words matter to us and we i wrote there you know when we chose the name circular built environment we took months 20 of us having big meetings and discussions and doing research and because that's what we do. What I think about is what Carol was talking about, what, what, what Martin was talking about and other people. When we want to work with learners across different, you know, yes, I, I personally, I'm not bothered what words people use. Um, as long as the direction of travel is good, I'm not too hung up anymore about whether it's circular or sustainability or eco or blue or green. I don't care as long as we're moving because the urgency is there. I think we can't slow ourselves down by having years worth of discussion and publishing on what do we call things. Thank you. It is a beautiful message to, to wrap up. And I think it's uh, so nice to hear from uh, such a prominent academic as you are, David, 
uh, that you are not there to fight for your definition, but that you are actually opening the playground for everyone to contribute and that we are jointly co-creating our new narrative. This is what counts at the very end. So thank you. 